Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online service here for January the 16th. We are continuing today in our exploration of the Gospel of Luke. Last week, we had a great introduction to some of the big picture themes that we're going to be looking at over the next number of months. And today, we're going to begin that journey with a series called When God Speaks, What Do You Hear? And that is going to be a fascinating question for us to dig into a little bit together over the next few weeks. As last week, there are some notes that you can download in the video description below me. Hit the show more link there and you'll find the download link that you can click on. There's notes that go along with today's teaching and there's also some extras that we just couldn't squeeze into a 20 to 25 minute teaching that you can look at a little bit more at home. Before we get to that and some other things, uh, just a, a few items for you to take note of this week. And to me, this is really exciting. We are online for our Sunday service right now, but there's lots of cool stuff happening in our New Life community. People are connecting, they're relating, they're taking care of one another, giving one another support, and that's a healthy sign. So well done, New Life. And here's a few more things for you to consider being a part of if you're not right now. The first of those things is our prayer network. We've really been trying to build this out over the last few months. And if you'd like to support your New Life family by praying for one another, you can head over to our website. That's newlifecollingwood.com. Go to the very top to the menu bar, hit the prayer button and choose prayer network. You can ask to join that. We will let you in for sure. And you can be in prayer for one another. If you find yourself going through something and you would love to have our ministry staff or the prayer network or both praying for you, you can join that from the same button. The prayer button at the top of our website, choose prayer requests and we will pray for you. We're also looking to get our home churches back up and running this winter and spring. These have been on pause uh, since COVID began. Um, We were fortunate enough to have some fairly large groups meeting in homes. And of course that became not the best idea pretty quickly back in 2020, but we're looking to get those relaunched in a safe fashion very soon. So if you'd like to be part of a home church or if you'd like to lead or host a home church, please let us know. NewLifeCollingwood.com slash home church. You can explore some different options. We're considering to do this in a safe way, but also just to get back into this where we relate to one another, building friendships, building family, and just deepening our journey of faith as we sharpen one another, uh, taking deeper looks at our teaching, at scripture, and at life. Well, finally, last week we introduced you to Alpha Groups. New Life is part of a group of Southern Georgian Bay churches that are encouraging their congregations to invite those friends or family that they have that aren't right now into church, not sure what following Jesus is all about, to join an online Alpha Group to learn a little bit, to explore that in a really safe place where they can ask the tough questions. So these are going to begin in March online, and I'd love to have you take a look at this quick story right now of what the impact of an invitation looks like. Check this out. My father was a difficult man to get along with back then. I think he saw God as a crutch, and he saw faith as something for the weak, and he had given his life to things that he saw as valuable, uh, work and money and material gain. For a few months uh, after I started serving in Alpha, I felt that I should be asking my dad to check it out, but knowing my dad, I didn't think it was actually possible. Uh, until one day I was making myself lunch in the kitchen and uh, he came in and he said, you know, I really have noticed a difference in you. Well, I uh, really honestly didn't want to go, but I'll do anything to support my, my children and he knew that. 
Uh, he wanted me to be there, so, so I agreed to attend. The beginning was, because I was reluctant, it was a little uncomfortable for me to go walking in there the first week, but the videos were powerful. The atmosphere was extremely comfortable. It was like visiting with a bunch of friends and having a meal. What I didn't expect was that it, it expanded my horizons and, and opened my heart to, to understand faith better, and I really didn't expect that. Within a few weeks, I was totally enthralled with Alpha and looked forward to going, which honestly was not the case in the first week or two. I wasn't in control. Um, there were things that were working in me that I was aware of, but I wasn't very open-minded. And Alpha basically gave me the opportunity to understand myself and my relationship with God so much better. Life is much more peaceful today. It still has its ups and downs. Life's like a roller coaster a little bit, but I think Jesus has kind of taught me to, to enjoy the ride. I invite people to Alpha all the time simply because I know what it's done for me. Well, before we head off into the rest of our service, um, I want to encourage you at the end of Paul's teaching this morning, don't close those browser windows or your app or whatever you're watching on right away. We have something extra to share with you at the end of that teaching. So I encourage you to, to stick around just for a couple minutes for that. And as we head into um, a time of looking at scripture and of worship and of teaching this morning, I want to share with you again um, from the, the guide to prayer for God's people, this week's morning invocation. It says, O Lord Jesus, in this hour, let me hear again your call. Follow me. My steps, you know, are prone to wander. So come, therefore, I pray and make your way clear before me. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's been quite a week. My name is Heather, and my family has been attending New Life for about five years. I'm also one of the leaders of the You in Mind support group for people living with anxiety and depression. It's been really rewarding going through the program with the participants that we've had and being able to help them. If you'd like to follow along in today's reading, I'll be reading from Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 55. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. This is also called the Magnificat. Again, it's Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 55. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. This is the word of the Lord. Servant. Now 
all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me. Holy is His name. Mercy to all, all those who fear Him, from generation to generation. He has shown the strength of His arm, scattered the prideful. Brought down the mighty and lifted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, the rich with nothing. gone before us the promise of grace hey folks that's a good song I'm going to invite you to take a moment and pray with me now Father we thank you for songs like the Magnificat this song of Mary and what it has to say to us about who you are and about what you are doing in this world because it reminds us of what you have already done. I thank you for, for Luke, for this person that, that took the time to carefully investigate uh, the stories and the sources that were circulating about the life of Jesus and he produced another one that we still have today that the church has always seen as valuable for us to understand, not just the teachings of Jesus, but the story of Jesus, his life in its totality. And so as we sit here today, as we, um, as we study online together, as we hear uh, your good news story, that the kingdom of God has broken into this world and is growing and growing and advancing and turning things upside down in so many of the norms that we've become so used to. May your spirit, through these words, through the gospel of Luke, through the song of Mary, may it inspire us May it encourage us today. May we hear you speaking loud and clear. For those that are listening and are frustrated and discouraged, God, give them uh, a sense of relief, a sense of hope, a sense of uh, assurance that all will be well. For those that are struggling with, <clears throat> with illness or with loved ones who are struggling with that, um, Bring relief, bring healing, uh, bring those around them to offer them comfort and hope. And for those who are exhausted and who are tired out with not just the pandemic, but with so many things of life, uh, may they find uh, a new life, a new wind, uh, a fresh breath of air through your spirit for them. And those that are questioning, uh, questioning you, questioning reality, questioning whether or not you're there and that you care. May they find in Jesus and in Luke's gospel um, 
a good news that uh, is exactly what they need to hear today. So we love you, we thank you, we worship you, and we praise you. Amen. Well, that was a great song that we just listened to. It's the Song of Mary. It's called the Magnificat, uh, often named that way for the first word of the song in Latin. And it's interesting how songs can capture our attention, how they can inspire us in ways that, that just straight text can't. And so that song that was just sang for us, uh, I thought was just great because the author literally took the text and just sang through it. Didn't rearrange it, didn't, uh, didn't leave any of it out, just sang through the song, sang through the text that Heather read for us this morning. And while I appreciate what the, what the musician did there, I'm not sure I would take Mary's song and put it to that genre of music. Because I think Mary's song, if, if I were to put it to a genre of music, I would turn it into a punk song because I think that might capture uh, the heart of what Mary's doing. And I think it would capture a better image of, of who Mary is. But this song grabs your attention. I mean, look at these first verses of this song uh, that Heather read that the person sang for us. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, she says in verse 46 of Luke chapter 1. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And you've got this introductory hint that, that Mary's about to set off on some, some fighting words. People have looked down on me long enough. Now things are about to change. And, and I want to spend some time looking at, at Mary's song in a little more detail as we, as we kind of uh, entertain this idea of how God uh, is speaking today, how God has always been speaking to us when we're asking the question, what is God saying? What is God up to? But before we jump into looking at this song, I think it's important for us to see what's happening in Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, uh, Luke is introducing us to Jesus, but he's doing it through some pairings of other people. As I said last week, he's tying us back into the story of God's involvement with Israel and how Jesus is just a culmination of that. And the two dominant characters in chapter 1 are Zechariah and Mary. You could say it's Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph but predominantly Zechariah and Mary stand out, but only because they are leading us to, to the person that Luke wants to spend the, the entire rest of his gospel uh, um, portraying, and that is the person of Jesus. And that is what God has done in and through Jesus. So let's take a moment and let's look at this pairing of Zechariah and Mary, because I think it'll help us capture a little bit about what's going on in this song that we're reading. So let's look at, at Zechariah in who he is. He's a man. We're introduced to him in verse 5. Uh, his story goes all the way to verse 25. Then we come back to him in verse 57, and we have the song that he sings at the end of chapter 1 all the way to verse 80. And so here's Zechariah. He's a man um, that gives him more status in society than, than Mary would have. He's a priest, although he's not high up in the, in the priestly scheme of things. That still gives him a certain uh, amount of status and power among his people. Uh, he is well versed in the law. In verse 6, we're told that he is righteous in God's eyes and he is very obedient. And so in, in many ways, uh, Zechariah seems like a pretty uh, upstanding a decent guy, and he's, he's um, just probably an unassuming, ordinary guy that was going about his duties in the temple. But uh, the temple's in Jerusalem, and it's the very place where people would expect God to show up and have something to say. And Gabriel comes to Zechariah in the temple, and he has something to say to him. You know, there's this 
priest, this guy, this man, he's righteous, he's obedient, he's upright. He's just an all-around good guy. If we had to if we had to visualize what Zechariah might look like today, it probably would be like this. Hey, you you could take my picture and put my picture there uh, just as easily or a lot of other people. What's curious in the way Luke portrays Zechariah, not really in a negative way, but he does make the point that when Gabriel says to Zechariah, you are going to have a son, Zechariah has a hard time believing him. Because in verse 7, we're told that he and Elizabeth were childless. They couldn't have children. And there's a certain level of social disgrace that, that they lived through because they couldn't have children and they were older. And there's a hint there to the patriarchal stories in Genesis of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel. And you can read about Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 12 to 20. And, and you probably would do well to, to go and look at that and see how there's a connection there. So he's not ready to hear what Gabriel has to say. And so he just says like, well, you know, how am I going to know that this is true? In other words, give me a sign. And the end result is Gabriel says, well, here's the sign. You're not going to be able to speak now until your son is born. In the notes section, um, in the extras, I, I invite you to, to go online, look at the notes, download them, and interact with some of the extra stuff that I'm not actually covering in the sermon because you might find some of it helpful and encouraging. <clears throat> but there's some stuff in there about, uh, about some of this. But um, So... Luke takes Zechariah and says, you know, let me introduce you to this man. And that God was going to use him to introduce us to or to bring about uh, the birth of John the Baptist, who's an important person in the life of Jesus. But he's holding up Zechariah and then we're introduced to Mary. And we're introduced to Mary in verse 26 and 27. So you've got the picture of Zechariah. Now with Mary, um, she's this young girl She's a woman, she's not married, she's uh, quite likely uneducated, and she lives in a town called Nazareth in a region called Galilee. It is a nothing town in a nowhere, in a nowhere county. And it's the very place where, where people would least expect God to show up and God to have something to say. And yet, here we are in Luke 1, Gabriel comes to Mary, and he has a word for her as well. And it also is about the child that she's going to have. And what's interesting is Zechariah, the man who was the religious person, wasn't ready to hear what Gabriel had to say, wasn't fully grasping what God was up to. And then there's Mary, this young girl, this uneducated, uh, uh, unassuming um, probably looked at as not very useful for society kind of girl. And Gabriel shows up to her as well. And in the pairing, what you see in Zechariah and Mary is that they are both going about their ordinary daily lives. There's nothing extraordinary about what they're doing. And God uh, speaks into their lives in a, in a profound way, and they both have the opportunity to respond. And where, where Zechariah has a hard time understanding and accepting what Gabriel was saying, Mary actually, uh, in verse 38, as, as Gabriel tells her that she's going to have a child without being married, she says, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And so she's willing to accept what God had to say. And where Zachariah and Elizabeth were socially disgraced because they couldn't have children, and then they're delivered from that because they have John. Mary actually is not socially disgraced until she says yes to Gabriel. And then she becomes an unwed pregnant woman. And in her culture in that time, that was a huge taboo. So a man named Justo Gonzalez writing about this says, Jesus was born to a marginal person. He was conceived by Mary when she was unwed. Thus, while the birth of Jesus to Mary was divinely justified... It was nevertheless socially condemned. Jesus, as well as his parents, was marginalized from the time of his conception. So there's this pairing of Zachariah and Mary, of God um, 
interrupting their daily lives to say, I'm about to do something profound and you're going to be part of that story. So I want to spend the, the rest of our time this morning looking at the song that Mary sings after all of this has happened. And I think what happens with Mary's song is that people often get caught up in the first few verses that I've read for you already. How my soul praises the Lord, my spirit rejoices, God's looked upon his lowly servant, and now everyone will call me blessed. And I think we just get caught up with a version of Mary that's stuck in those couple verses. The, the lowly Mary, the blessed Mary, the quiet Mary, the serene Mary. I mean, look at the nativity scenes that are on our Christmas cards. And we've turned Mary into this um, innocuous, innocent, um, pale-faced, silent silhouette. And I, and I think it's because we got stuck in verses 47 and 48 and we forgot to read the rest of her song because the rest of her song uh, paints a very different picture about Mary. I mean, these words are revolutionary and, and um, a catalyst for people to, to take action. I mean, there are countries in the world where um, people are not allowed to read the Magnificat out loud in public settings because, because it, would, it would lead to, the, the governments, the powers that be have been afraid that it would lead to revolution and to things that they don't want. You gotta remember the political scene that Mary's living in. And in the notes, I talk about Herod and, and Augustus to help, to help paint that picture a little bit. But, you know, the picture that this song portrays of Mary is of a rebellious Mary, a revolutionary Mary, uh, a tattoo sporting, tough as nails, won't be put down, pugilistic Mary. Not, not a quiet, serene, subdued uh, silhouette. So let's look at some of the things that she says in this song, just so we, so we capture it. I mean, that song at the beginning, it is beautiful, the man who sang that. But I, but I think it just misses the, the heart of what Mary's doing. That's why I think this is a great, uh, great content for a punk song. God has done great things for me, she says in verse 49, and for all who fear him. And he's going to do great things. And then this is where she gets... Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm looking for the word. Um, here's where the words have bite. So Mary in verse 51 starts to say, you know, God's going to do great things and here's how it's going to play out. You proud people, you're going down. You powerful people, say goodbye to power. You rich people, say hello to empty bank accounts, empty pockets and empty hands. Well, what about the humble and the quiet and the unassuming? Well, they're on the way up. What about the hungry? They're going to get fat with good things to eat. God is going to help his people. He has not forgotten us. He is remembering his mercy that he promised to us. And what he promised Abraham so long ago, he is making good on it. Viva la Israel! And, and that's kind of, you know, and, and I'm doing a poor job of capturing the heart of what she is singing. But I got to tell you, if Zechariah looked like this, which is kind of how I think Luke's portraying him, then if you got to put an image to Mary, it's got to be something like this. Yeah, you know, these are fighting words. And, and I'm, I think I said this last week, if Herod and Caesar would have been given the lyrics to this song that she sang, and, um, you know, she'd have been arrested. And if you're paying attention, you know, the lyrics of, what, of Mary's song are not new. They are... They are pieced together from parts of the Old Testament, much like how we take lots of different uh, sayings and, and phrases in our world today, and we can weave those into a song. So go to 1 Samuel chapter 2, and you'll see uh, Hannah's song, the mother of Samuel the prophet, and what she sings. And you'll, you'll see some of, some of Hannah's song in the song that Mary sings here. But listen to what Justo Gonzalez says about Mary's song. It's not like many of the praise songs of today proclaiming how great God is. It's a hard-hitting proclamation of a God who overturns the common order of society. N.T. Wright says it's the gospel before the gospel. 
It's a fierce, bright shout of triumph 30 weeks before Bethlehem, 30 years before Calvary and Easter. And it goes with a swing and a clap and a stamp. And it's all about God. It's all about revolution. And it's all because of Jesus. This is a powerful song from a young girl who is not afraid to stand up and say, God is doing something great and he is turning things upside down and the things that we are used to in this world are no longer going to be at play in God's kingdom. It is the great reversal. And in some ways you've got that play happening here that Zachariah is somebody that we would tend to see as a more important person in society and yet it is through Mary that God is doing something great. And what I don't want you to miss, though, is that both of these people are going through their ordinary, everyday lives. And God speaks. And they both hear. And Zechariah has difficulty grasping it. And even in his failure to grasp what God is doing and his failure to trust God, God still uses him. And then Mary does receive it and she says, okay, let's go. Let's do this thing. And you see this, this young girl that would normally have no status that people wouldn't expect anything from. And here she is being elevated. I think Luke 1 is an encouragement to us because it's a reminder that God is still speaking today. And I'm sure you're there at home wondering, what is God up to? What is he doing? How do I hear what God is saying? And so where Luke 1 is an encouragement that, that God is speaking in our world today, I think it's a reminder that God is speaking today because God has already spoken emphatically in and through the person of Jesus that Luke is introducing us here in chapter 1. We want to hear God today, but I wonder if there's, there's more value in us remembering that God has already spoken and we just need to pay attention to what he has already said in and through the person of Jesus. And Mary's song and Zachariah's song are revolutionary songs and the heart of the content of them is Jesus. And let that sink in. I haven't even talked about Zachariah's song at the end of the chapter, but you can read that for yourself. And you can see what he is saying. Salvation is coming. And both Mary and, and Zechariah are kind of fixated on what God is going to do for Israel. And what we will see later in Luke's gospel is that, that they will have their eyes open because God's plan was for much more than just the salvation of Israel. It was for all of humanity that the kingdom of God was, was coming into this universe for the salvation of all people including the Romans, who were the oppressive power at play in the day, in the age of Mary and Zechariah. God is still speaking today because he has already spoken clearly and emphatically in and through the person of Jesus, the Christ. And I wonder what you're able to hear. Let's pray. In the spirit of Luke and the theme of great reversals, even what we see happening in Luke 1, I'm going to invite you to pray with me uh, the prayer of St. Francis, but in reverse. So the prayer of St. Francis, if you're not familiar with it, starts, O Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. And it goes on from there. So I want to pray the reversal of that with us today from, uh, from someone who's rewritten this prayer. And I appreciate it so much. Ah, did you hear that? I wonder if you missed the cuckoo clock. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord, make me a channel of disturbance. Where there is apathy, let me provoke. Where there is compliance, let me bring questioning. Where there is silence, may I be a voice. Where there is too much comfort and too little, a too little action, grant disruption. Where there are doors closed and hearts locked, grant willingness to listen. 
When laws dictate and pain is overlooked, when tradition speaks louder than need, grant that I may seek rather to do justice than to talk about it. Disturb us, O Lord, to be with as well as for the alienated, to love the unlovable as well as the lovely. Lord, make me a channel of disturbance. Amen. I, I pray for you today that this great reversal these things that we're not expecting uh, to just begin to resonate with you. That the song of Mary, the song of the lowly, the outcast, the marginalized, and God's favor for them would sit with you and disturb you, would be a, a catalyst for you to just ponder, what are, where is God speaking today? What is God saying today? And to actually understand some of that through what he's already said in and through Jesus, through what Mary's singing in her song today. So thanks for checking in and, uh, and following with us today. Uh, next week, we'll, we'll jump into some of this birth narrative and how God is speaking through it. Bye for now. Well, hello again. There is one more thing that I need to share with you this week. So earlier this week, I had a conversation with Christopher Rosevear, our next gen director, and he advised me of his decision to resign from that director's role. And that was hard news to receive because we love Christopher and he's been a great fit to our staff team. But for personal reasons, he feels it's important at this time for his well-being and that of his family to step back from professional ministry duties for a time. So what does that mean for our next-gen ministries? Well, Christopher will conclude his responsibilities on January 30th, Sunday, January 30th. So that's uh, for another two weeks. He'll be serving with us. And in that time, we're working on a plan for moving forward in our next-gen ministries. And we will continue to minister to our children and teens through these challenging times. Christopher and Amy are planning on staying as a part of New Life and staying in the community, and we are really thankful for that. And I would ask that you reach out to Christopher and Amy and thank them for the work that they've done over the past two years through some very difficult times. And we are sending out an email that will be going out later this morning that will have uh, contact details in it for Christopher. And I encourage you to just reach out to them and thank them uh, for the work that they've done, for who they are, and the impact that they've had. So Christopher, we are thankful to you for your service, uh, for uh, the gifts that you have brought to our staff team and to our ministry, and most of all, we're thankful for you and the heart that you have for loving God through the way that you love the people that he has brought into your life. So please pray for Christopher and Amy and pray for us as we kind of figure out the next steps of uh, what will be happening in our next gen ministry. And uh, there'll be information coming, about, coming out about that in the days uh, and weeks to come. So you can watch for that. Well, stay tuned for those details and uh, do pray for them. Pray for us. Thank you for, um, for reaching out to Christopher and Amy to say thank you. And we'll see you uh, next week. Bye for now.